Hi Year 11 and welcome to the third of our Twilight sessions. Um, I thought this one probably would be slightly better if I pre-recorded it rather than conducted it live for two reasons. First of all, this was due to be the night before your mock, so I didn't want to do that to you. And second of all, I have a feeling this one's going to run slightly over the hour. Nigeria is a pretty big case study and there's a lot of content in there. I've tried to kind of narrow it down a little bit for you, but there is a chance that we're going to run over. Um, as always, Make sure that you've got something to write with. I would suggest that having your pre-existing notes from the lesson, um, that probably would help save a bit of time and means you don't have to rewrite everything out and it's just a case of adding to it. Um, but any sort of paper and pen would be a good idea, really. Um, so we're still on paper two and we are now on section B. So the last couple of Twilight sessions that I ran, uh, we were looking at section A, which was urban. We've now shifted onto section B, which is the change in economic world. OK, so everything about this particular section is around um, how money impacts the development and therefore the quality of life for the people that live there. And we've got two major case studies for this section, the first of which is Nigeria, and that's our newly emerging economy example. And the second one is the UK. OK, so this time we're not looking at cities specifically. We're looking instead at the whole country. OK. Uh, just like I did previously, I just through what you need to know for this unit. Um, so the key idea here is, is that some um, newly emerging economies are experiencing really rapid economic development. So i.e. their money is, is increasing quite significantly. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, that doesn't always then translate into the same sort of development for social, environmental and cultural uh, changes but it does lead to changes, okay? So the whole point of, um, of this is that you are focusing on the newly emerging economy um, and the growth of it. But please do be mindful that the exam questions are gonna ask you um, to, to always pick an LIC or an EE, okay? So in this instance, when you see that, it is Nigeria it's referring to. Um, and also be careful. So as, as geographers, we always try to separate things and categorise things. Here it's quite explicit about the fact it wants you to consider the social changes, the environmental changes and the cultural changes. So do just be mindful of that and keep that in mind when it comes to revising um, that you can categorise these things really, really clearly. Um, so on to the case study then. The whole point of the case study is that it helps you illustrate certain things around this topic. Um, and do please notice that the location comes up again. Um, so when we looked at Rio and when we looked at London, we spent a bit of time kind of locating where those places are and also the importance of that. Um, that, again, has come up in this section. Um, so your general sort of geographical knowledge does count for something. Make sure you know where Nigeria is, please. Um, we will go through it, but make sure you know. Um, this, I've noticed, comes up quite a lot for this particular type of question about Nigeria, the, the whole um, issue around the wider context. So the political links, the social links, the environmental context with which the country is placed in. Um, do do make sure that you're aware of them. Um, it won't always be a big question that this relates to. It could be a two or a three marker. But the exam board want to know that you understand the context with which we're studying Nigeria and its background. So we will go over things like uh, the, the colonisation of it and why that's impacted. But they do expect you to know that. Um, where it talks about the industrial structure. So this is a bit I feel like we do really, really well with the UK and I feel like you're on board with it, but you can't forget about it for Nigeria as well. And um, we want to talk about the different sectors, i.e. the jobs um, and, and what has led to the current situation that Nigeria is in. So it's really important to understand how the economy grew so quickly and then what the what the problems and the implications are for that continued growth. Um, this bit often comes up as a level question, the, the role of TNC. So remember, TNC stands for Transnational Corporation. I'm going to go through one example with you. There were two that we gave you and you can use either one of them. That's absolutely fine. But I really would suggest that you need to be prepared for this particular one in a leveled question. So i.e. a four, a six or a nine marker. Um, I would suggest that needs to be in quite a lot of detail, i.e. you need a specific name of a TNC. I would pick one and I would learn 
as much as you can about that, but definitely look into the advantages and disadvantages. There needs to be an element of discussion if this question comes up, because that will be expected. Um, as you can see, it's mentioned in the spec there. I already sort of mentioned about the wider context, and I'm bringing it up again because it's mentioned again in the spec. So being aware of that and knowing the relationships that Nigeria has with other countries. Again, I'll point that out to you, but it wouldn't be, um, you know, out with the realms of, of helpfulness if you were to go and do a little bit of reading around anything that I've mentioned today, particularly when it comes to things like the TMCs or the UN. Um, and then also make sure that you are comfortable with international aid and the aid that Nigeria receives, as well as the sort of environmental and economic impacts. Um, that's quite important because, it, it, again, those things tend to come up as a leveled question. Um, they've come up as six and nine markers previously. The aid one in particular has come up a couple of times now. Um, that doesn't really tell us it won't come up again. It could do. So, so just be mindful of that. But basically, this slide is a, a, a what you need to know. OK, so with that in mind, then, with the location of Nigeria, um, hopefully you remember that it's on the African continent, because um, remember, Africa is a continent. Um, it's located on the west, um, the western coastal area of that continent, and it borders the countries of Benin, uh, Niger, Chad and Cameroon. And it sits on the Gulf of Guinea off of the South Atlantic Ocean. Um, if you were to kind of look at a map and, and relate it, if you need some sort of reference to where it sits against the UK, it sits roughly due south of the UK and it's about 3,100 miles from us. Um, it's an hour ahead. So if you were to travel, that's kind of the direction you were going. That sort of stuff is helpful because the UK is something we can relate to. So if you can remember where Nigeria sits in relation to the UK, that would count as subject specific knowledge. OK. Um, because of its location, then Nigeria has got quite a tropical climate and that means it's got variable dry and rainy seasons in different parts of the country. Um, so, for example, in the south, it tends to be mainly hot and, and, and quite wet. Um, it's quite a, an equatorial climate, whereas in the north, um, it's a lot drier. Remember, we, we covered this when we did ecosystems in the first, um, the first paper. We talked about how equatorial climates tend to be hot and wet. That's where most of the uh, rainforests are found. For example, just um, where it says Lake Victoria there, you can see the lake. If you go slightly west to that, that's the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And that's known for having quite vast jungle, uh, rain, rain, tropical rainforest areas. Whereas when you go slightly further north, you can see that that cuts through the Tropic of Cancer, that line there. So it tends to be far more desert like um, uh, uh, climates that are experienced. And part of that's because of um, things like the uh, mountain system that runs through northern Africa as well. Okay, So the location of Nigeria is quite specific. It's uh, on the coast. It's not um, on the tropical kind of boundary, but nor is it completely um, in the desert boundary, which means that the country itself um, is quite amiable for people to live in. Okay, So it's, it's easier for people to settle than it might be in other parts of Africa. Um, when we looked at uh, Rio and London, we talked about the, the global significance of it. Um, and so we need to make sure that we were able to do that for Nigeria as well. As we know, we've described Nigeria as a newly emerging economy. Um, and it was actually part of the second wave of the original um, emerging economies. And that was alongside um, Mexico, Indonesia and Turkey, hence MINT as you can see on the screen. So the original ones uh, made up the, the acronym BRIC. Um, the original newly emerging economies were Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Um, they were kind of your, your rush of, of economic growth in those countries. The second wave was these ones here, and Nigeria was part of that. Um, please remember that whilst this means that they have experienced rapid economic growth, it doesn't mean that the level of development has grown at the same rate in these places. Um, Nigeria supplied 2.4% of the world's oil. Now that's pretty significant. At the time when this when this was taken, that was in 2014. Um, it was the 12th largest producer of oil. That's that is um, very significant in terms of money, but also in terms of status. And much of the economic growth of the country came around because of those oil revenues. Um, 
but it has diversified uh, more recently to include things like financial services, telecommunication and media. Um, in 2014, Nigeria became the world's 21st largest economy. That's that's big. And it's expected that by 2050, it will sit comfortably within that top 20 in terms of largest economies on the planet. But the fallout from COVID, as you can imagine, that turned everything on its head and lots of trajectories for planet uh, for countries that were positive have now taken a bit of a shift. Um, COVID meant that recession uh, kicked in for Nigeria in 2021. And unfortunately, the country is still now in recovery. So in terms of where that that trend is going, it's a little bit unknown at present. Um, they were on a really positive move upwards, but since COVID, um, it's, it's a little bit less certain. Um, the Nigerian economy is significant because it's one of the largest on Africa. Um, since the late 1960s, it's been based primarily on uh, petroleum, as we just heard, um, and a, a series of oil um, uh, price increases from the, the kind of early 70s meant that there was a huge growth in things like transport, reconstruction, manufacturing and government services too. So they were able to invest in all of these sectors and that in turn then has led to more money being uh, created because more jobs have been created. Um, in 2016, so a couple of years after, uh, after their sort of initial growth, it did experience a recession. And part of that was because prices for oil fell globally within the industry. But it did start to pick up again pretty quickly after after that point. So, you know, Nigeria has um, relied quite heavily on oil, but it has started branching out and it's used those revenues to branch out a little bit. That doesn't mean it's been exempt from recession. Money aside, Nigeria is pretty politically important. And the reason for that is because it ranks and has ranked as the fifth largest contributor to UN peacekeeping missions. Um, and that started in 2014, but it maintains that record currently as well. So as well as um, having a feet comfortably at the table in terms of a large economy, it's a significant economy because of what it's selling. And on top of that, it's now politically important in terms of UN peacekeeping around the world. How it is significant uh, within Africa, though. Remember that it is a country within Africa. It doesn't represent the whole of the continent. So therefore, it does have significance uh, within that continent as well as globally. Um, we know that Nigeria has seen a rapid economic growth. We've talked about that. But it's also one of the fastest growing economies within Africa itself. In 2014, it had the highest GDP of the African countries and it had the third largest manufacturing sector as well. Um, so in terms of jobs and, and money contributing to the continent as a whole, it's, it's significant. And it might come now as a surprise, uh, but then it had um, a, a, a significant population in 2014, which was 182 million people. But today that has increased quite significantly and it stands at roughly uh, 211 million making it the largest of any African country. Um, Ethiopia is second to that, and that's 202 million. So it's a big country with a big, big, big population. Um, despite what we have discovered about Nigeria's economy, however, um, it has really low levels of productivity. Uh, there's really, really uh, widespread issues over land ownership, partly because of um, colonialization. Um, However, it still has the highest farming output in Africa as well, actually, and 70% of its population are employed in the agricultural sector. Um, most of these farmers do actually farm for themselves, so we call that subsistence farming. You see that come up just periodically. Um, so although there's a large percentage of people employed within that sector, a lot of people do it for themselves, and it's mainly focused on cattle farming as well. Um, the largest number of cattle on the African continent belongs to Nigeria. Okay, so it's pretty significant. Um, Nigeria is set to kind of pave the way in terms of Africa's future development as well. They put a lot onto uh, the development of Nigeria for that. And it's got huge potential being cited as the golden country. Um, so Ni Nigeria is pretty critical to, to uh, models being set for other African nations as well. Now, that is despite huge problems it's suffered over the years with corruption and a massive lack of infrastructure because of a lack of investment.
So just to sum up, Nigeria is very, very significant to the country. We'll see why on the next few slides as well. Um, it's significant globally, um, but it doesn't come without its problems. So let's start with some of the context. And let's begin with the political context. Um, quite annoyingly, the, the fate of African countries uh, was initially set up by a really small group of European countries in 1883, and that was at the Berlin Conference. And this was uh, Western ideals. They literally carved up the continent and took control over its countries between them. If you look at the map a little more carefully, you will notice that the borders between the African countries uh, fall on quite straight lines. Um, and that's because people did it. That's because Europeans divided the land up into nice little neat sections um, according to what those sections had to offer and then basically exploited those sections of the natural African uh, resources that were there. That included its people. So as well as raw materials, people were taken and traded, um, obviously as slaves. Um, and that wasn't just in America, although that's been well documented. That was within the whole of the European continent. And by the, the sort of 60s, um, that thankfully had begun to come to an end. And most countries have managed to regain their independence. That was Nigeria included. So we broke free from uh, British colonial rule in the 1960s. Um, but un unfortunately, like lots of other countries, um, the curse of, of, of the stopping of colonialism uh, meant that quite a lot of uh, conflict and a lot of um, corruption and power struggles and a series of dictatorships then ensued. And unfortunately, not long after they gained independence, Nigeria ended up in the middle of a civil war for, that ran for three years. So as you might expect, this amount of instability seriously affected the ability of the country to uh, develop and it led to really widespread corruption. Um, the, the, the corruption, unfortunately, um, was rife throughout the whole country. Um, and it's only really been since 1999 when armed forces um, ceased being in control and they, had, they managed to have a successful democratic election that a more stable government was um, elected. Now, that's really significant because whilst this isn't history, you do need to understand the context behind why um, it's been so hard for a country like Nigeria to, to grow. When you've got corrupt or unstable governments and a dictatorship, usually um, wealth and resources are not well looked after and there's discrepancies around how that's done. Um, and where you have war and conflict, money gets invested into that instead of into services or infrastructure. So it does it does really hamper the ability of a country to do that. So 1999 was a huge turning point for Nigeria. And um, there were subsequent elections then in 2011 and 2015. And those two elections in particular were viewed globally um, as being fair and free on the whole. And so that was really positive because that changed the global significance for Nigeria and it changed their status globally too particularly within the, the UN. Um, as a result of this uh, continually growing, um, the, the certainty, I mean, more investment then has begun to come through to, China, uh, to Nigeria, which is fantastic. So a couple of examples of that. China um, is, is a, a major world uh, economic player and it's made significant investments in the construction sector in particular. South Africa is investing in businesses and banking. So South Africa um, has also been under colonial rule. They understand that process, but they have managed to climb the wealth ladder and development ladder a little quicker, pardon me, a little quicker than some of the other countries. Um, and perhaps just as importantly for somewhere like Nigeria, American com companies are interested too. And that's that's not just to do with the oil. Um, they're interested in the country and, and its people. And so they're now investing in things like new power plants and um, the transnational corporations that are operating there too, things like Walmart and Microsoft. So the political context is quite significant. They've uh, undergone rapid changes of independence. They've become a far more democratic uh, society and they are now experiencing investment from some of the bigger global players to so China and America, two of the biggest economies on the planet. In terms of the social context, if you remember, we talked about the part 
Part of the appeal of London outside of the UK was largely owed to its diversity and its multi-ethnicity and multi-faith attitudes. That true is really, um, really fair or to say of Nigeria as a country. Um, social diversity is seen as one of Nigeria's strengths, which is absolutely great. Um, unfortunately, though, it's also a source of uh, some of its major conflicts. So there are four major ethnic groups that make up the Nigerian people. The largest of which is the Yoruba, and that's 21% of the overall population. Um, there's lots of other smaller ethnicities spread throughout the country, um, which isn't a problem on the whole. And it's, it's, it's generally speaking uh, well received. And religion wise, um, there's a really lovely mix of Christianity, Islam and then traditional African religions as well that are all widely practiced. Um, as we've seen in all of our case studies, though, when you end up with an increase of wealth, that quite often brings along inequalities with it, and Nigeria is no exception to that. Um, unfortunately, in recent years, there has been quite a growing uh, disparity between the North and South, um, and that disparity, that divide, has led to the creation of new ethnic and religious tensions that maybe perhaps were there before, but not necessarily brought to the forefront. Uh, in particular, the rise of the Islamic fundamentalists, Boko Haram. So you've probably heard of them on the news, and um, that has been uh, quite significant in terms of what they've been doing. It's certainly uh, put off a lot of investors, and it's led to quite an unstable situation in more recent years. So that has negatively impacted the economy. Um, however, uh, that being said, it's, it is just that particular fundamentalist group that's causing the issue, and they have had support globally in terms of tackling it. With the cultural context, um, alongside having a really popula uh, diverse population, they've got quite a rich and varied culture. And again, that's something we saw commonly with Rio and London as well. Um, you will possibly need to articulate some of the key cultural attributes that Nigeria has to offer. Um, this has come up a couple of times in the form of like a two or a three mark question. And they want to know that you understand the social aspect of this as well, the cultural aspect. So I just wanted to go through some of these with you um, as well at the same time. So let's just start with Nigerian music. Um, Nigerian music is pretty big news within the country and across the whole continent. Um, whilst it's, it's long been known for sort of more gospel type music, um, there are quite significant contemporary genres that are in there, including Nasia music. Um, and that's really, really diverse. It's quite a vibrant genre and it blends things like Afrobeat and hip hop and R&B uh, and reggae, sorry. Um, and, and so this is quite on trend. It fits in with quite a lot of Western uh, type music that's out at the moment as well. So therefore, outside of Africa and the African continent, this is now a, a growing, a growing type of music. You might not believe this, you might not remember this, uh, but Nollywood, which is the Nigerian version of Hollywood and Bollywood, is actually the second largest film industry in the world. Hollywood is not as big as you think it is. Um, and actually, in terms of a global platform, um, it, it is uh, Bollywood that, that, that comes in first, Nollywood second, and then Hollywood is, is third. Um, so it just kind of puts our understanding of the world um, in, into maybe perhaps better context. Um, there have been several significant Nigerian writers, but interestingly, because of its British colonial roots, that means a lot of the literature that comes from Nigeria specifically is actually English based. So that might not sound like a big deal, but what that does mean is it's is more accessible uh, worldwide. So they are able to pump out quite a lot of um, literature that isn't just read within Nigeria but and, and the continent, but also worldwide. And then we come to sport. Um, the Nigerian football team, whilst they might not be um, in line for winning the World Cup, the Nigerian team has won the African Cup of Nations three times. Um, and uh, it, it has it first appeared in the World Cup in 1994. So I know um, to those of you that are avid football fans, you might not see them as a great contender, but for this country, that is that is impressive. Um, and for the continent, that is significant. Um, so it is considered by many as the giant of African football as well. So there's a lot going on there and a lot of similarities to London. Um, if you look at some of the things that, that, that we talked about in terms of the cultural context for London as well.
One of the other things that you need to be able to articulate is Nigeria's connections with the wider world. We've already discussed the significance of uh, Nigeria's history under British colonial rule, as well as the political status that brings. But it's really important that you understand there is a current story with Nigeria's links, and these have changed considerably over the years. You might be asked about that too. Okay, um, I have seen a question um, recently where I asked about the UK's changing links. We'll come to that on the next um, twilight session, but by the same thread, they could expect you to understand where Nigeria is currently. Um, because Nigeria was part of the British Empire until the 1960s, its main political links at that point and, and even currently were with the UK and other members of the empire. But it has um, it has started to change. And uh, since becoming independent, Nigeria has then opted to become part of the British Commonwealth. And what that means is uh, not that it is governed by the UK, but that it has equal status with all countries within the Commonwealth, including the UK. There isn't a hierarchy when it comes to the British Commonwealth. Although Nigeria is a republic, it recognises the British monarchy as head of the Commonwealth. Um, so just in case you're not sure what, what that sort of means, there are 56 countries within the Commonwealth. And um, although many of those countries were once under British rule, they no longer are. So there is no one government that's in power. Those countries can choose whether or not they want to recognise the heads of the Commonwealth as the British monarchy. Um, I suppose in a way this is a more um, modern version of swearing allegiance, um, but they do not need to. It's purely symbolic. So that means that they have um, they have equal status. Therefore, no one country has any more power or rule over anyone else. That's important because it means then that uh, trading links are fair and even. Um, and it does mean then that they have a, a seat at the table um, and a voice. Nigeria's political role has changed in recent decades, and we've already discussed the idea that they had stabilised enough to be considered an integral part of the UN peacekeeping missions. But they've also become a leading member of the African political and economic groups. So, for example, the African Union, who, like the UN, um, actively work in economic planning for the African countries, as well as peacekeeping across the continent, um, they're, they're a huge player in that. Nigeria is specifically in allegiance with its partners. It's got a really good relationship with those neighbours, um, those neighbouring countries. Um, so we've got Niger, Chad, uh, Benin and Cameroon. And those particular countries are not yet at the same um, political status as Nigeria. And so there, there is still some unrest in those areas. And Nigeria will provide troops in times of need. So they, they do have allegiance with neighbours, they have allegiance within the Commonwealth, and they have allegiance with some of the, 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 the stronger economies around the world. Um, Nigeria could not possibly become the country it is or have the economic status it does without having had and continuing to have strong trading links. So we need to consider these two and we need to be prepared to answer questions about this. Nigeria is a major global trading nation. Okay? Its main exports are mainly in crude and refined petrol, uh, natural gas, rubber, cocoa and cotton. So there are a few raw materials in there and it has traded uh, well and it's traded cleverly. Um, but it is crude oil that dominates the Nigerian exports. Until 2013, uh, the USA was Nigeria's biggest customer. However, recently the demand for that has fallen. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot in the news around uh, oil and where it's coming from and the politics behind where it's being bought and who's buying it. And so that did change. That relationship between the US and Nigeria changed. But India currently now buys the majority of the oil. And India is one of those quieter economies that is rising really, really rapidly and is set to be one of the strongest economies in the next 50 years. So that's not a bad place for Nigeria to have struck up a partnership with. Um, price aside, Nigerian oil is deemed to be of much, much higher quality than quite a lot of that that's coming from the Middle East. Um, but unfortunately, because price is sore, as it does, um, quality falls because everyone's looking for the low costs and low costs take priority in business. Um, so although the Nigerian oil, um, which I think had a funny term like the, the sweet stuff, um, Although it's better quality and they, in theory, should be able to charge more for it because 
um, because so much is coming out of the Middle East and they're able to lower their prices, they're, they're losing out on quite a lot of, um, of purchasing from that particular area. Interestingly, one of the fastest growing imports to Nigeria is telephones. Um, so you might not have seen that one coming. I don't know if you would have read that one necessarily in the textbook previously. The reason for this is because the, the rise in wealth that they've experienced across the country uh, generally, combined with the growing population that we mentioned, means that there's a bit of a growth in the middle classes. And it's those middle classes who can afford those sorts of luxuries. Um, Nigeria ranked seventh in the world for the number of mobile phones being used. Um, just to put that into context, the UK was ranked 16th. Um, I don't know why I would know that, but I do. Um, as you can see currently, so this data was actually taken last week, it sits at uh, world eighth place. Um, but look at the difference in the population sizes with the countries above it. So this is a uh, number of phones being owned uh, China sits at the top, that might not surprise you, but if you look at the, the number of phones against the number of the population, there's not a huge discrepancy there. Same with India. Um, Indonesia, you start to see a bit of a discrepancy between the number, number of people and the pop, uh, number of phones and the population, um, and, and a smaller discrepancy with the US as well. But when we get down to Nigeria, it literally is pretty much um, a phone per person in, in that population. Um, so, so it's it's worth considering, but yeah, they rank eighth in terms of mobile phone um, imports. So we spent a while talking about the oil situation, uh, which as we know has contributed significantly to Nigeria's economy. So that's really important and we don't wanna not talk about that. However, traditionally, it has been other primary products that have been Nigeria's source of income. Um, so for example, things like uh, cocoa, um, timber, palm oil specifically, and cotton. So cotton was one of the original reasons why um, Nigeria was, was colonized in, in the first place. Um, and it, it did lead to um, quite significant money, but not money that Nigeria inherited or was able to benefit from. So why is uh, the, the economy growing and developing then? Well, oil was a game changer um, and it was it was that that contributed to the significant growth initially of the, the country's GDP. In fact, it accounted for 14 percent of the GDP and a whopping 98 percent of the earnings made on the exports. Um, they are thought to still have around 40 to 50 years worth of oil supply left, which is great. Um, but that will need to be a consideration in the coming years about how they're going to maintain their economic growth. And that's why mentioning things like the Nollywood and the African football um, matter, because they need to di diversify. Um, in terms of why it's changed, we mentioned 1999 has been a time of significant change um, in, in Nigeria's history because of the stability of the government uh, around about that time. But it also coincided with major changes in the industrial structure. Um, employment in agriculture started to fall a little bit, and that was mainly due to better machinery um, being invested upon and created, um, and the conditions of other sectors, mainly in things like construction and manufacturing of, of oil uh, products being better, alongside better wages. So it's those push and pull factors again. Uh, remember that we talked about um, the transition um, from primary sector into secondary sector. So that's your primary sector dealing with raw materials into secondary sector, which is doing something with those primary uh, primary materials. You get more money. So take wood, for example, you cut down some wood and you sell it, you will get some money for it. But if you can cut that, down, that wood down, sell part of it, but make something from the wood, for example, a chair, you get more money for that, that product than you will for the raw material. So as they were able to gather some sort of momentum with the money they were getting from the oil, they were able to start reinvesting in things like the technology that was needed in order to diversify in other areas. Um, and with that then, better wages and better standards of living started to come around. So industrialization is a huge reason as to why Nigeria's economy is developing. And if you have a look at that mind map in the middle there, you, you can see a lot of reference there to technology and uh, increased use of telecommunications, for example. Um, 
So we've already discussed many times the effect that things like industrialization has had. For example, we did a lot of it about the UK. We talked about um, the, the impact that it had in London specifically too, uh, but it has affected other countries like Nigeria too. This isn't exclusive to the UK. So things like um, motor manufacturing, sugar refining, oil refining, pharmaceuticals, these are, are all now really prominent industries. And so they've shifted from predominantly a primary sector job job sector into secondary and tertiary. Um, there has been a growth, as we can see, within telecommunications and, and finance has brought with it a demand for more highly skilled workers and with it then better wages as a result. So these changes have meant that Nigeria has now shifted from being reliant on only a few products in one sector to a slightly more balanced economy with a variety of sectors that make up jobs. That's really, really, really important because Countries who historically have relied on a single product, for example, oil, um, often find that they can't continue to keep up that growth um, or they can't keep corruption out because one, one person is in charge of it and they end up squandering the money or not to doing things um, in a way that would be sustainable. Um, so please do have a look at, at these reasons behind why Nigeria's economy is developing, but don't forget to tie it up with things like um, the, the change in political status, the change in democracy, and also the investment that's gone into it as well. Um, there is more on pages 224 and 225 um, about the manufacturing specifically. So I really encourage you after this to go and have a look at that um, and be able to talk about manufacturing perhaps in a bit more detail. You do need to be able to talk around that. Um, so please do go and have a look at that. OK, so I just want to move on to this bit then. Um, you remember that this was mentioned very specifically on the spec. TNC stands for Transnational Corporation. Do make sure that you can spell that. You don't have to be able to say it. Um, a transnational corporation is essentially a large company which operates in several countries. Usually it's got its headquarters in one country, normally the country where it originated in, and then uh, production plants or factories in many others. So traditionally those headquarters would originate in uh, wealthier countries, Western countries, HICs, such as the USA or the UK. Um, and then the factories would be in lower income countries, for example, like Badesh, uh, Bangladesh. However, there has now been a shift towards these TNCs originating from the likes of Asia and the Asian Pacific. So, for example, Japan um, and then setting up in more westernized countries or LICs or NEEs within Oceania or Latin America. So there has been a bit of a shift in this. Um, some of the reasons why TNCs choose to operate in other countries include things like tax incentives. So they don't have to pay as much corporate tax if their products are manufactured in a different country uh, with different tax laws. Um, so I don't know if you've seen the news recently, but corporate tax in our country has just gone up um, to 25 percent. And so that means that companies that are producing and manufacturing have to pay extra money on top of, of uh, basic tax. That is significant and that can uh, damage profit margins. So if they can put their factories in a country where the laws are different and they just happen to normally be lower income countries, then they manage to evade um, having to pay quite as much tax. Um, something that I know you all will be aware of is usually they get cheaper labour with it as well. So if you think about it, the pound is stronger than many of the Asian and African currencies. Therefore, we can get a lot more work for a lot less in countries like that. However, contrary to popular belief, TNCs actually on average tend to pay locals 40% more than the local businesses in those areas can. So what's really important here is whilst, whilst um, we do accept that sometimes pay and conditions are not OK. They're not always actually being exploited with these TNCs um, the money wise. Quite often they will be paid quite significantly more than any local businesses would be able to pay. And that's what makes them really appealing. However, often it is the conditions and the regularity of pay that make that whole thing controversial. Um, please do be aware that, especially within the UK, the laws around around that um, have changed and there is something now called the Modern Slavery uh, Law, um, an act, 
which means that companies have a legal obligation to make sure that they are monitoring that sort of thing if they do have factories in, in those other countries. Um, and then the final reason would be more relaxed environmental laws. And so many Western countries um, have already gone through that whole process of industrialization. And so actually they're the ones mainly to blame for the pickle that we're in currently with uh, global warming and things like chemical pollutants and contributing to gl climate change. However, the problem is that many newly emerging economies in low income countries are not quite there yet. They've not had that opportunity in the same way. And so their laws don't yet reflect the need for those types of industries to be a bit greener and a bit cleaner. Um, so their laws are slightly more relaxed to enable uh, industrialization to take place. Western countries like the UK benefit from that because when we set up our factories, we don't have to abide by the UK or EU laws surrounding that. Um, operating in several countries means for TMCs uh, that there's more profits because do the math, they've got more people to sell to. Um, it's a really good business model and it means that they're more likely to have high profit margins because they can sell their goods in bulk. Um, they can sell cheapish, but sell in really, really vast quantities. Um, and so that means that they, they, they're getting in a, a higher profit, mainly because they've got minimum spend on overhead. So for example, things like the expense of buildings or the higher wages. So all of this builds into a really good model um, of, of, of business and um, TMCs are um, significant within Nigeria. I obviously forgot to put the arrows on there. Okay, so just a bit of a recap then for you. Uh, some of the major reasons why TMCs work, um, they, they get tax incentives, so they're able to boost their profit margins. They get cheaper labor um, within countries like Nigeria. More relaxed environmental laws, meaning that they are able to do what they need to do. And all of that results in higher profit margins. OK, so let's have a look at um, Nigeria with its TNCs. So um, there are around 40 TNCs operating in Nigeria. Um, hence why I'm saying you do not need to know any more than one. We've looked at a couple um, and I'm only going to focus on one tonight, but there are over 40. The majority of them have got their headquarters in the UK, the USA or Europe. Um, but please don't forget what we said about British colonial rule impacting for many years after. OK, so uh, this has also had quite an impact in terms of what businesses you can see in Nigeria. Some of the names you might recognise that are operating in Nigeria are, as you can see from the, the pictures, KFC, Shell and Unilever. So you need to have uh, these handy for the questions uh, in the exam that ask you to talk specifically about advantages or disadvantages um, or pros and cons of TNCs or something that's worded similarly. If you see the word TNC in section B, immediately think about your, your case study example and the pros and the cons of that. Okay. Um, using the examples here will help you show the examiner that you've studied something specific and then you can apply what you know to a real situation. So please try to avoid what we call the geography of, of nowhere. Um, whilst it's really important you understand the theory behind the TNCs and, and how they make money, you need to be able to talk about it within the context of Nigeria specifically. Um, there are so many pros and cons to TNCs um, and so picking some of these out and learning some of these is really good. But do make sure that you consider the impact specific to a company, for example, like Unilever. Um, the examiner wants to know that you can balance these up and a specific example will help you tailor these in. OK, so um, I'm going to focus on Unilever. Um, and let's start with the basics then um, in terms of the TNCs. Um, so some, some advantages, uh, the companies that move into the countries like Nigeria often provide regular employment and stable wages, and they develop um, skills in, um, in the workforce that weren't there before. OK, so that's, that's pretty important. That raises the overall standard. Um, all of that in turn then will, will boost the local economy because of the regularity of the wages that's coming in and the increase in the wages that are being um, are, are being made, uh, that means that there is more money in the local economy than there was previously. Um, and then that in turn will benefit the smaller, more, more local businesses too, because people have got more money to spend. Um, so another benefit to that is the smaller businesses. 
Um, TNCs don't tend to just uh, buy a building and then keep to themselves. They often uh, will go ahead and acquire the land round about that or acquire the building. Um, and so that often then means that they um, they start putting money into uh, the local area, the infrastructure, and sometimes even the education within that particular area. Um, if you think about it, it's in their interest to have a functioning community rather than just a building where people go to work. They need to be able to transport their goods. So um, strong infrastructure is, is needed. Um, and, and that means that locals will also then benefit because uh, they will have access to that, that strong infrastructure. So they'll be able to travel um, better to get to other, other places of work. Um, and they'll want to ensure also the TNCs that they can recruit more than just one generation of workers. So investing in things like education is important for them because um, they don't want to just ensure um, a current workforce in the TNC, but they want to ensure that there are enough workers in the coming years to support local businesses, um, such as the banks and the restaurants that help keep the TNCs in place. OK, so there's lots and lots and lots of benefits to this. TNCs um, do provide the ability for a country like Nigeria to raise its general sort of standards and quality of life. And it kickstarts that that local economy that might otherwise not be there. Don't forget the power of uh, business stimulating business. So those smaller businesses and that local investment is really important. The TNC can't operate without things like banks. So in order to do that, you need skilled workers in order to operate those banks. OK, and um, when you're talking about the, the advantages and disadvantages, try and think about it like a discursive um, a discursive essay rather than a list of pros and cons. OK, and um, the, the higher level marks, the, the level eights and nines tend to get that because of the, the fluency with which they're able to, to talk about it. Um, but we also know that the media tends to be very, very good at pointing out the downsides. So I've left this one to second um, to, to look at. Um, TNCs are not without their issues. So local workers can sometimes be poorly paid or not paid for the number of hours that they actually work. Um, because of the local laws being so different and uh, often much, much, much larger companies um, kind of outsource a lot of this stuff, um, then actually monitoring and checking up on the, the conditions of the workers um, doesn't always happen. Um, and, they, uh, and if they do check up, then intervening can take quite a long time. Um, so local workers can end up uh, being in quite quite awful conditions. That's been really, really well documented. But please don't fall into the trap of only focusing on the negatives. It is a negative and it's not a good thing. And we do need to talk about it. But it's not all negative. Um, another issue is that management jobs quite often will go to the foreign employees. Um, mainly because the initial skills that are required to do that will come from uh, the, the sort of foreign employees that have come in. Um, the, the skill that's needed simply is not present in the current workforce. The issue with that is it creates animosity then between the staff and then that prevents progression, at progression within, within the workplace at later stages for those local workers. Um, so they can be biased towards the promotions that are being offered. Um, perhaps one of the biggest issues um, uh, that, that have actually managed to be uh, worked out, I suppose, is that historically much of the profit that gets generated by TNC goes back to the home country. And so then the country that's playing host to the factory um, doesn't gain anything from this. So therefore, the, the profits tend to leave the host country and it doesn't actually benefit them in any way other than the wages that have gone up. This is being massively changed and there's lots of rules and regulations now for TNCs to try and ensure that they uh, they are paying a certain percentage into the, the, the country that they're, the ho the, are, is hosting them. Sorry. So let's have a little bit of a, a closer look at Unilever specifically then. Um, you can, of course, choose Shell if you prefer. Um, you can do both if you're able to, but I've just chosen one because I feel like um, you need to have a good solid one behind you. Um, just a little bit of information then. So Unilever is an Anglo-Dutch company, meaning that it, its roots are uh, within the Netherlands and the UK. It's rooted in European rules and, and regulations. Um, it's, it's got a joint headquarters both in London and Rotterdam. So it is, um, it is a fairly big company. Um, its main products um, and its main things that it produces are within the food and drink industry. 
but it also has some items for home, such as like cleaning products and self-care. So some of those names on that screen you'll see, like Dove, for example, and Sif. Um, um, they've got over 400 brands, so I couldn't possibly put them all down there for you. Uh, and, and that all comes under their umbrella of, of Unilever. It sells products in over 190 countries across the planet. So they are an absolute giant in terms of TNC status. Not one of the obvious ones, um, but definitely one that is significant. Um, Unilever started operating in Nigeria in the early 1920s. Uh, so that might surprise you. I, I didn't personally realize Unilever was quite as old as, as that. So it was 1923 that Nigeria first um, allowed Unilever to start manufacturing within it. And it was actually the manufacture of soap that, that took place there, mainly because um, one of the, the, the key raw ingredients that the Brits like to use to make soap really lathery, which was palm oil, uh, was produced plentifully in Nigeria at that time. Um, so yes, we went in and we exploited. Um, since then, however, the company's obviously massively diversified. It's not just soap, and we have since stopped exploiting in the same way, thankfully. Um, and, and it currently employs 1,500 people in Nigeria alone. So if you think about that as a, a, a workforce, that's pretty big. A misconception about TNCs is that they don't consider the cultures and the needs of the local markets that is there. So, that, you know, Western ideals storming into an African uh, country and kind of doing things the Western way. Unilever um, has worked really, really hard, actually, to dispel that and not to, to do that. Um, many of the products that are produced in Nigeria are aimed at the Nigerian market. Um, and so that means that, you know, lots of uh, brands are actively trying to improve people's quality of life specific to that area. Um, and that's really important because that gets the buy in from the local uh, people. But it means that the investments that are being made are useful to the area, too. Um, it works with the locals, which is really interesting, not just to produce new products, but also to try and raise standards and try to promote things like sustainable business models. Um, so it's all fine and well investing in an area, but if people don't understand how to do something sustainably, then when that TNC or when those people leave, that can all fall down. Okay? Um, so there's a lot of positivity that Unilever has been bringing to Nigeria. It's not all been plain sailing and it did start with significant exploitation of raw materials, but they've evolved and they have tried really, really hard to, to make sure that what they're doing is embedded so that it, it boosts the quality of life and people there. That being said, it's not without its controversies. Um, if you go onto the Unilever website itself, which I did last week, you can see for yourself, they actually have this. Um, on on their site, um, it's a really really easily accessible. They've not tried to hide it. Um, if you if you click onto um, kind of the, the statements section where it talks about them, uh, they've got quite an array of issues. Um, some of them have involved child labour and poor working conditions as a, as a company. I mean, now none of these specifically mention Ni Nigeria. If you look at it, like there are uh, mentions there of Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, there was something else about Sri Lanka as well. Um, none of them are uh, kind of admitting, I suppose, to these happening in Nigeria, but it doesn't take much digging online to find articles that relate to past issues. Um, so Nigeria's issues with Unilever uh, historically have been around things like workers' rights um, and, and uh, conditions of workers. The important thing to recognise here, however, is that not all of it um, is negative. So don't be drawn into the trap of focusing on the negatives in an exam response. Um, the, the examiner wants to see an element of balance. So, so show that you understand there is a balance. There, there, there are pros and there are cons. And ultimately, all of this within the, the Nigerian context is adding to a better quality of life. And Unilever has worked really hard to take into consideration the socio-economic and the cultural side of things whilst it's doing it. But obviously, there are still some downsides too. So just think really carefully about how you're going to maybe phrase that in an exam. And it might even be worth coming up with some sort of template that you could um, go back to if that question comes out. You know, like a pre-written answer in some senses. OK. International aid. So this aspect of the newly emerging economy case study has come up quite a few times. Um, 
please be careful falling into another trap of thinking that aid um, is only in the context of natural disasters. So having marked um, quite a few of these answers over the years, wherever we get to section B and aid is mentioned, people panic and they go back to things like Chile and Nepal. Um, that's not necessary. We do talk about international aid as a means of helping a country to develop. And that's what this whole section is about. OK, um, so in this section of the exam, paper two, the examiner is looking to see that you understand within the context of poorer, less developed countries, the aid is often the means of being able then to support and enhance a country's ability, ability to develop. So what I mean by that is to move through the different stages of the demographic transition model and move from stage one and two into three and four. In fact, often these types of questions are closely linked to the theory of DTM. So if you are unsure of what I'm talking about right now, can you make sure that you go back and have a look at that theory? Um, because the, the two are interconnected. Aid is very simply defined as um, assisting people. It is that simple. Um, it's vague and it's supposed to be because it's not always about sending help. Um, it's not always about fast response to disasters. It can often be about providing developmental aid in the form of money or people or services. This is less well documented in the media um, and it's often seen as a long term support given by charities and governments and um, you know other organisations. Um, and, and we do hear a lot about it, but we don't see the, the more long term side of things. Um, all of this help uh, is, is being given ultimately to improve the quality of life to the people within the country. And that could be through providing things like money, as, as we've just said, but it could also be through providing the means to safe access to water sources, for example, or education or improving things like the infrastructure. Um, i.e. the buildings and the roads, or even something as simple as electricity supplies. OK, so all of that falls under the context of aid. Um, it doesn't have to just be money. So we've talked a lot about Nigeria's transition through through the different um, phases of the industrial sector. We talked about how it's got a lot of money. So why on earth would somewhere like Nigeria require aid? Well, despite the rapid economic growth that Nigeria's had, is that's not yet transpired into development. And so unfortunately, many people who live there are still considered to be really, really poor. They've got limited access to things like clean water, sanitation um, or even regular electricity supplies. And so that means they're actually really, really quite unproductive. And I don't mean that in a critical, nasty kind of way. I mean that their physical ability to have a productive workforce is quite severely hampered because without clean water, they're not able to uh, wash, wash themselves or they quite often will fall sick because they're drinking dirty water. Sanitation is an issue because that creates disease um, if it's not done properly and that can lead to people being sick and not working. And electrical supplies mean that quite often things like cooking um, or, or operating a laptop or a phone, things that we take for granted, isn't possible either. So all of that transpires into things like really low literacy rates. So people not able to read and write. Huge proportion of the adult population can't read and write. So therefore getting those highly skilled jobs that we talked about with Unilever becomes even harder. Uh, infant mortality is still pretty high, so the ability of a child to live past its first, first birthday decreases with the lack of clean water and sanitation and ele uh, electricity, but also a lack of paediatric doctors and nurses. Uh, Generalised GPs are fine, but paediatrics, those that deal with children, are, are needed in order to make sure that they're given the right sort of care. Children's bodies are very different to adult bodies. Um, and so unless you've got those sorts of skilled workers in, in place, you will have higher death rates in children. And because of all of that, then life expectancy is pretty low. Um, so therefore, in many ways, Nigeria does need support, making sure that its population is able to uh, raise the standards of living um, and to be able to access the types of jobs that's going to help pull them out of poverty. It is essentially a cycle. OK, so think really carefully about that poverty cycle and do use that phrasing as well. All of these things connect back to why um, Nigeria needs aid. So let's look at the specifics of international aid within Nigeria. It receives um, about 4% of aid that's given to all African countries. Now, that's pretty high for a single nation. 
in 2013, the aid that it received totaled around uh, $500 million, and that came from countries like the UK and the US. It also came from some other world organisations such as the World Bank and some other uh, non-governmental organisations as well. Um, but they, they received quite a lot of money, but it is really essential, um, mainly because um, aid has brought and continues to bring benefits to people that live in poverty. The most successful projects that have been put in place um, in Nigeria have been the, the smaller community-based projects um, because these are supported by smaller charities and they're often able to help deliver um, more exact help to where it needs to be rather than sort of generically going into the government pot which then gets absorbed and lost into the general system and put into other things. Um, but with the smaller projects, the aid that's been given is used for the whole project, so it's not lost or wasted. And they tend to get the local people on board as well, and that makes a huge difference because, um, you know, they, they have to be able to do it for themselves. So any great big national initiatives are really, really hard to get everyone on board with. Um, here are some examples of what aid um, is given to, to Nigeria. I would recommend learning one or two of the examples and then considering what the impacts of these could be specifically to the people receiving it. Um, I think there's little point really in learning all of the examples because um, marks will be given for knowledge, but more than likely um, it will be given for being able to develop that within the context of the question. So what I'm trying to say is have a named example, but being able to talk around how it helps and the evaluation of that and coming to a judgment is probably more likely to get you the mark. Um, so as we now know, Nigeria has had quite a history of corruption and instability since its independence in the 1960s. Um, and one of the main results of this has been uh, that much of the aid delivered to and via the government has been a lot less impactful or efficient than that that's been given to the smaller uh, communities directly. Um, several reasons why it wasn't used properly. Um, major corruption, as we know, not just by the government body, but also by individuals, is a major reason why uh, money has been lost in, in Nigeria. Um, the government um, has and, and does sometimes divert money to be used for other purposes, not necessarily to benefit other individuals. But, for example, there have been rumours of monetary aid being used to help support and build Nigeria's navy. No one can blame them for wanting to do that at all. Um, but it isn't helpful when you're trying to build um, the population up and uh, prove trust and transparency by the government. Um, and then the people are still left without that. Um, and 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 so that that is an issue um and unfortunately aid is just not given because people are nice and lots of lots of um the donors or money have political sway or or influence over what happens with that money so people are nice and they'll donate but they usually put it with some sort of tie and um, they put it with some sort of say over how that money gets used and it quite often then gets used to promote self-interest of the donor rather than the needs of the area. So within Nigeria, um, these are the reasons why aid has not been successful. So there are a couple of examples and um, I suggest you go and have a look um, at, at those examples within Nigeria, they're in the textbook, but these are the reasons and this isn't necessarily uh, spoken about properly within the textbook in my opinion these are the reasons why it hasn't worked necessarily in nigeria okay so moving on to this next little bit uh, we don't have too long to go i'm aware we've just come up to the hour mark and um, so i'll get through this bit as quickly as possible for you I promise there's not much much more to go um, unfortunately, alongside the benefits of the rapid growth that we've seen, so too can negative elements really play a role in a country's development. Like in Nigeria, the impacts of these can have really devastating effects on the environment. So we've already talked about that quite at length within the UK. We know that a lot of the changes that we've made have been to accommodate um, you know, the, the industrialisation and now the deindustrialisation process. Um, but industrial growth can be particularly harmful for many reasons. So let's start having a think about some of these. Nigeria has um, about 5,000 registered industrial plants, um, but then there's a further 10,000 illegal small-scale industries. Um, 
whilst on the face of it, that's great because it helps promote economic growth. Uh, the issue there is that with so many unregulated industries, controlling and monitoring the waste from them is almost virtually impossible. And that has led to really significant environmental problems. Um, Lagos is the capital of Nigeria. Um, and this is one of the places that we know um, where pollutants go directly into open drains and water channels. Um, people access that uh, for drinking purposes. So very much like Rio, Lagos is um, very well known for its slums because of the volume of people that have tried to move into the area. You can see the picture there, um, picture A, uh, where it says air, air pollution in Lagos. The, the shanty towns, the slums are, are significant. Um, these, these illegal um, industries that are pumping chemicals out into the air, but also into the water systems, are really causing significant health concerns for the people in that area. The pollutants are really harmful to people, but also, all, as well as that, the ecosystems are further downstream. Um, some industries don't dump their waste directly into the water, which in the face of things is a really good thing, and they promote themselves for that. But the problem is they dump it elsewhere and uh, their contaminants end up eventually seeping into the ground and end up in the underwater aquifers. And that affects the water quality too. So whatever way you're kind of looking at this, the pollution of the water within Lagos particularly is a massive concern because as we talked about earlier, without access to clean and healthy water, that's really detrimental to not only public health, but also to the ability for um, uh, products and things to be, to, to be made. We've also then got the issue with the gases that are released by the chemical plants. Um, that is an issue to health in lots of ways. It's been linked to lots of deaths. Again, we saw that in Rio. Uh, we saw that in London. It's also present here in Nigeria. And it's, it's um, linked to huge increase in respiratory diseases and cancers as well. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, with this industrialization and this growth, um, unfortunately, it does bring with it significant problems. The difference, I suppose, here to what we've seen before is that this is now hampering growth. Um, the issue with a large proportion of the employment being in the raw materials, uh, which it is, is that the land becomes exploited rapidly. And without good management, that creates further issues down the line. So, for example, between 70 and 80 percent of Nigeria's forests have now been destroyed, not just because of logging, but to make room for things like agriculture or urban expansion and um, making space for factories, so the industrial development. That in turn has led to a massive loss of vegetation, which leads to desert desertification. Um, and that's one of the biggest environmental issues currently in Nigeria. That gets made worse because it's so hot, they have to irrigate and they build large dams and that further degrades the land. So. All of this economic growth, whilst it's really, really, really important, there isn't really an aspect of their environment that they aren't degrading to a significant and catastrophic rate. And none of this is sustainable. So, you know, you take out the public health concerns from that, the physical land that they're trying to reap these raw materials from at some point is not going to be able to sustain what it is they're doing. So in terms of the economic growth in the environmental context within Nigeria, this is worrying and this is an issue and it's not been managed properly. As we know, uh, with economic growth usually comes urban growth. Okay, So our whole first section of this paper is about urban growth. Please bring in what you know from that section to this section. As Nigeria's developed, urban areas have also grown rapidly, and this in itself has brought about changes. So we already know, we talked about where we've got influxes of people moving for better services and resources to the main towns and cities, you will end up with things like squatter settlements. So this is common in most cities. And again, within Nigeria, in the four major cities that there are, this is the case too. Um, this is because of a lack of affordable housing or space in the city itself. Um, and so don't forget that all of this contributes to um, the overall picture of Nigeria. Um, one of the defining characteristics of a newly emerging economy is that the money is there, but the development has not quite matched that. So when it comes to things like services being provided in Nigeria, they're not able to keep up with the economic pace of things. And um, the services just simply are not um, are, are not helpful. Um, and, and that is that is a huge challenge. Um, so 
still, despite the money within Nigeria, access and things like doctors or schools is a huge challenge. With a large population comes large volumes of waste. And unfortunately, um, this uh, too falls under the services that aren't being provided. So you saw a picture on the last slide of uh, rubbish being dumped. Um, and waste disposal has become a huge issue within Nigeria um, and across its cities. Um, very simply, the waste isn't being collected. Um, that in turn uh, will eventually lead to, to things like um, disease and spread of disease because uh, this dumping ground of waste usually attracts things like vermin, like rats, and that brings uh, disease and, and issue with it as well. Um, so you want to be re really, really careful about, uh, about expansion when you're not being able to put the services in place um, to support it. Um, okay, and then the final one that I've got in here is the traffic congestion too. So we talked earlier about how um, there's a growing kind of middle class that can afford things like mobile phones, but they can also afford things like um, cars and, and motorbikes. Um, so therefore, car ownership and bike ownership has become a, a you know a huge uh, number within Nigeria and Nigeria cities. But that alongside it brings traffic congestion because they don't have the right uh, infrastructure to support it. So they don't have uh, roads that are built for it. They don't have, um, uh, you know, cars and regulations around cars to make sure that the exhaust emissions are, are cleaner. And um, quite a lot of the cars that are there are older, so they give off um, more pollutants in, into the atmosphere. And they don't really have any means of containing that either. You can't tell people to go out to work on one hand, but tell them they can't travel on the other. Um, so this has become a massive problem too. Um, on, with, with the rise of the growing economy, people own more means of transport, but the, the, the uh, infrastructure in place to support that isn't there yet. Okay, So that's another really good example of a country having money, but the development not quite matching it. Um, OK, so we're almost there. The, the last little bit then is around the mining and the oil um, extraction. Um, mining and extraction of raw materials and precious materials is important for somewhere like Nigeria. We know that um, it's kind of what's catapulted them um, onto, onto the world platform and where a huge proportion of their in income initially comes from. Um, however, unfortunately, the processes behind these physically being extracted, particularly oil, um, often lead to serious issues around pollution and contamination of the land, the water and the air. Uh, for example, lots of oil spills um, in the Niger Delta have caused quite significant impacts on um, freshwater and marine ecosystems. Um, that's an issue because the further this oil and the, the spilled oil uh, spreads, um, the more likelihood there is for fires to start. Um, oil spills are synonymous with fires and they're really, really dangerous, not just for the people that are around that area, but because they send significant um, amounts of harmful gases, including CO2, into the atmosphere. Um, that causes respiratory problems, but also contributes significantly to things like global warming. Um, but another impact of, of this is the, the release of harmful gases is that they create acid rain. Um, and so that also is really harmful to the plants and the aquatic ecosystems, but also to the life of the people that are there. So what we're trying to get at here is economic growth is great, but with it comes quite a significant series of challenges alongside it. Everything from, you know, the environmental impacts to the um, to the urban challenges that we can tie up with the first unit to the sort of bigger global picture actually around the mining and the oil extraction. So the final question is around this idea of quality of life. You know, Nigeria is seen on a global platform as having made lots of significant changes. It's really boosted its economy. It's come back from not only colonialization but also civil war. Um, but there are some downsides too and and so you need to be able to to kind of explore all of that and um, several exam questions have centered around a more sort of summative approach to this unit that's focusing in on the quality of life that all of these economic developments and changes have brought um so you need to also make sure that you focus a little bit of time on summing things up and coming to a conclusion
this is my conclusion you might have come to a different one um but on the whole life for the people in nigeria has improved so if you're looking for a baseline quote to start any sort of nine marker that asks you about the quality of life overall life for people in nigeria has improved particularly since the year 2000 and the shift in the political democracy that was a real key changing point for the country generally speaking people have higher wages therefore more disposable income and that results in more money being spent on things like schooling and home improvements foods um foods out with the necessities i should say so kind of luxury foods um clothes and recreational activities all of this matters because the improved access to these resources and services means that productivity at work is higher as it is in school too therefore students are leaving school with better results they therefore stand a better chance of getting a, a more highly skilled job, therefore stand a better chance of getting a higher paid job. And the more that all of this occurs and the more that cycle perpetuates, the more likely it is that the standards of living will be raised for the whole country and therefore the quality of life overall will improve for everyone. So to sum up, yes, I think that the quality of life is improving and the majority of people are seeing some of the benefits. This being said, and here's where you need to consider your balance. People in Nigeria are still living in poverty and many areas of the country continue to experience poor access to things like healthcare. Uh, sanitation is not where it needs to be, particularly in inner cities like Lagos and reliable electricity is an ongoing problem, which does definitely hamper the ability to improve in all regions of the country. Um, particularly when it comes to things like the ability to access schooling and uh, setting up new businesses. Um, it would be fair to say then, I think, that whilst the quality of life has improved, the gap that remains between the rich and the poor has actually widened in this country. And the wealth that has been accumulated from the oil industry hasn't been used as effectively as it could have been, especially when you compare Nigeria to other countries like Singapore, um, who are now far more developed than Nigeria is, but who both started off in the same sort of um, uh, position. In order to continue improving, and this is something we won't know yet, particularly with the complexities of uh, the recessions because of COVID, for example, and the current crisis with oil. But in order to continue improving, Nigeria needs to ensure that it does not become singularly dependent on the oil that it's selling. Remember that that could be a sticking point for them. They need to be able to diversify and continue to diversify. And more importantly, I think they need to be able to maintain stability in the government because it's that that's going to allow them to um, continue growing um, and not fall prey to disuse of money. But also to increase the momentum from the investments um, that are coming in from abroad and make sure that they maintain those relationships with places like India and China who are two of the, the most uh, vast economies on the planet and set to become the biggest. So if they play their cards right, quality of life for Nigeria could continue to improve uh, far, far better than it has done up until now. So, ladies and gents, I hope that's been really helpful for you. We've gone slightly over the hour um, as prescribed, but I did say that this was a slightly bigger case study. Please take the time to look back over some of those notes, go back and listen to the bits. Maybe perhaps you felt that went a bit too fast and, and, and think really carefully about how you could use this information uh, within your answers. Not every question requires you to use this, um, but look out for the ones that refer to LIC NEE and it's Nigeria for the section B paper two that you need. Any questions, as always, come and see me. I'll happily talk to you, no problem, or re-explain things that, that need re-explaining. All right, folks, until the next Twilight session, happy studying.